Welcome to the third and final session in our series, Detoxifying Machismo, the importance of Latino fathers in prevention and recovery. My name is Dr. Pierluigi Mancini, the director for the National Hispanic and Latino Addiction Technology Transfer Center. It has been a pleasure to be your host and moderator for this series. Before I introduce you to our panelists, here are some brief instructions about the event. The presentation portion of this series will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will also be dubbed or closed captioned in Spanish and Portuguese. We will not be recording the Q&A conversation portion of our series in order to invite open conversation. Also, please be aware that closed captioning is available and you must activate it by clicking the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen and choosing show subtitle. A copy of the presentations will also be made available after the series ends. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation so as to minimize background noise and other interference. When we get to the QA portion of our webinar, we will have an opportunity to ask questions by clicking the Q&A box and I will present the questions to our presenter. Or you can raise your hand and I will unmute your line in order for you to ask the question out loud. Please do not log off at the end of this session as we will be also asking you to fill out a brief survey. This satisfaction evaluation is important to the work that we do and provides us the opportunity to improve our training efforts. This will be your opportunity to evaluate and provide feedback for this entire series. I'll be showing you a QR code that you can activate using the camera function on your smartphone. We're also proud to announce that we are now offering NADAC CEs for an additional cost. Information about reciprocity with other licensing bodies and payment processes will be provided after the conclusion of the series. Instructions on how to access a certificate of completion will be provided to you via email at the conclusion of the webinar and after the completion of the satisfaction evaluation. The next few slides are for informational purposes only, and you can read them in your handout. We want to welcome back our three panelists, Mr. Roberto Gursa, Mr. Juan Escobedo, and Mr. Brian Serna. And as we mentioned as the last session, as you saw, each one of them has led a session. Tonight is Mr. Brian Serna's turn. For today's session, we may be experiencing some technical difficulties. If we do, the session will continue with the panelists holding a conversation with those who are in the audience. We hope this will not come to pass, but if it does, be sure that we will continue this important topic with you until the completion of our scheduled time. Before we get started on today's presentation, want to take a few moments and to check in and ask if there are any questions or comments about the first two sessions from our panelists, or if they would like to make a brief comment before Brian begins. And we can start with Roberto or Juan. So um, I'll just really just say uh, hello. Welcome back to everybody. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, our third session. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, right? Uh, to uh, everybody across, um, everybody who's attending. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, Juan? Yeah, definitely. And thank you again for um, allowing us this opportunity to have this crucial conversation. Um, and it seems like this is a continuation, right? Our last session, we talked about the other side of the coin, um, where we took a little deeper dive into, you know, what it means to be an honorable man um, and how those kind of processes um, come up in our family circle and um, and once we start thinking through our biases and so on. So, you know, with that kind of spirit, all the way from when Roberto started to um, me bringing up that, that conversation to now where we're heading with Brian around care provisions um, and different, you know, workforce development components. I um, just want to thank everybody to um, being here present with us and um, allowing us this conversation with y'all. Thank you, Juan. Brian Serna is a licensed professional counselor and a licensed addiction, uh, alcohol and drug addiction counselor. He is the principal at Brian Serna Solutions. And with that, I give you Brian Serna. 
Hello, Brian. We'll just mind starting us off today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pierluigi, and, and thank you to my colleagues, uh, Roberto and Juan. I'm happy to be here today. And so uh, my presentation today is going to be focused on lessons learning from lessons learned from working with Latino fathers, young and old. And I wanted to start us off with a poem uh, written by a colleague of mine named Adan Baca. So Adan is, um, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I've known him since graduate school, which at this point is 20 years. <laughs> I've known Adan and um, he and I have, have both worked extensively uh, with Latino males, young Latino males, young Latino fathers, older males, families. You know, we've, we have uh, been colleagues for, for many years. And one of the things that I love about Adan is he is um, he's a very gifted poet. And so I, we were talking about this workshop that I was giving um, and I asked him if I can uh, read one of his poems and he said that he would be honored if I did. So I'm going to go ahead and read for you a poem by Alan Baca called El Hijo. And he wrote this poem in memory of Corky Gonzalez. Um, for those of you who don't know, Corky Gonzalez was a civil rights activist who was very instrumental in the formation of the Chicano movement. And so um, at, at the passing of Mr. Gonzalez, Adan Baca, um, he started to write a tribute poem to Corky Gonzalez, but it wound up being all about his son. And I think it really um, speaks to some of the complexities of the Latino identity when it comes to Latino fathers raising Latino sons. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and read that for you now. El Hijo by Alan Baca. Mijito is the culmination of years spent searching for heritage, genealogical ancestry, yo soy Joaquin, with invisibility, incomprehensible understanding, searching for meeting and greedily dispelling the erasing of my history. He has charcoal colored ojitos, they do not yet know the meaning of institutional inequality. The heir to Española cruisers floating into an endless escape from the Norteño reality with one arm dangling out the window and one hand gripping the steering wheel carelessly. Cool September evening air mixed with rock and roll oldies and New Mexico rancheras, gritos, cheetos, and anarchy. And he is the heir to late night border crossing so-called immigrante ingenuity, hiding from the migra to serve a racist society. He is Del Rio from the river renamed the border to separate and pacify. He is Cisneros, dirt poor and dirt floor vaquero, ojo caliente family man rancharista, sweeping school hallways and califas in order to keep his land. And he is Baca, Bus boy, machinist, Socorro slave name Apache domestic servant, farmers, musicos, and angelic namesake sent to guide him. He is Spanish soldier. Sevilla, Zacatecas, and La Nueva, La Via Nueva de la Santa Cruz de la Cañada de los Españoles Mexicanos. Hacindero, encomiendero, killed in the Pueblo Revolt. Exiled to El Paso, wearing rags as penance for his sins. He is mixed blood mestizo army with a Christian name and blood on his hands. He is chief Don Jose. He is Zuni woman. He is not even earning more than a name. One, two, three, four, five hundred years later, Mahito is walking now. He takes wobbly steps. He falls and laughs and sees the beauty in everything. When he is scared, his arms reach out for his mama, and she is comforting my panza, and, he, and she is comforting. My panza is a tambor as he pounds like the conguero with intensity, and he dances when he hears the Blue Ventures or the Cumbia Kings. My hito is everything, from the past, the present, the future, and beyond reality, an ancient map of names and places before 4th of July firecracker noise pollution and obnoxious bumper sticker patriotism splashed daily in my face. Road rage, debt, and drug abuse have, have become the only gifts we bring to the manger like three kings who have lost their way. 
Macho insecurity and assimilation at all costs. Blind us from the past, bind us to the past. Mahito is walking now. Mahito is Maria and me. Mahito is his ancestors. Mahito is Joaquin. So again, that's a beautiful poem written by Alan Baca, uh, who is a very much a practicing therapist dealing with addiction and trauma here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is where I'm also uh, coming to you from is Santa Fe, New Mexico. Next slide, please. All right, so in approaching this topic, um, the way I organized it in my mind was asking myself, well, why this topic? What are the problems we're trying to speak to in these workshops? And so these, these are my take. This is my take on the problems. Um, number one, Latino fathers are reluctant to engage in formal systems of assistance. So this is something that uh, my colleague Juan Escobedo talked to, uh, spoke to in his presentation um, a couple of weeks ago, that the formal systems of assistance are, um, are not set up to welcome Latino fathers, Latino, Latino males in general. And the effort needed to engage Latino fathers or Latino males is often seen uh, as it's just not worth it. It takes too much time, too much energy to engage those, those males. I've seen this a lot in my, um, in my career. One of the things I do in New Mexico is not only am I a behavioral health provider and I own a behavioral health agency, um, but I do a lot of teaching and training of other behavioral health professionals and consulting. And one of the consulting um, things I did was, this is a, in a small town called Socorro, New Mexico. And I was, uh, they were telling me, you know, with a lot of pride about their family program. I said, that's great that you're engaging families and how are you getting the dads to come in? And they just looked at me sheepishly and they said, we are not getting the dads, we're only getting the moms, you know? And, uh, and they said it to me almost like, of course, you know, how could you think we were getting the dads? They don't wanna be involved. And so I, I find that frequently um, that people just don't know how, they get overwhelmed um, and, uh, and they just give up. They say, well, you know, the dads don't wanna be involved. So, so we're not gonna involve them. We'll just work with who comes in but they have to look at themselves. And so the next bullet point here is hours of operation are built around staff's uh, preferences and school schedules, but they're never built around the schedule of a very um, hardworking Latino male, to be, to be frank. You know, and just in my own experience working with Latino males is, uh, I work a lot with people who are involved in construction, agriculture, um, that sort of thing, that where they spend most of their working hours outdoors. And what that translates to is that in the winter time, they can come and see you after work, after the sun goes down at about 5 p.m., 5.30 in the winter time. But in the summertime, the sun doesn't go down until 8.30 p.m. And that's when they get off of work. You know, their, their work day is driven by the, the amount of daylight they have. And so for uh, an agency to really want to welcome um, people that, that are involved in those kinds of uh, industries, they need to have flexible hours and they need to see people after dark, not just after um, five. Also, the, the sterility of clinical atmospheres often make Latino males uncomfortable. A lot of times what I see when I go into offices, whether it be a, a, a standalone behavioral health center that's a nonprofit or even um, maybe it's a behavioral health clinic embedded into a medical practice, I see a lot of um, images of, of women or children very few images of males. Um, and so Latino fathers are often um, forgotten or even avoided by behavioral health service providers. And uh, many clinicians feel a need to protect their clients who are often women and children from the fathers, right? The fathers are seen as stubborn, obstinate, old fashioned, patriarchal, um, you know, rigid, uh, sometimes un uneducated, you know, there's a lot of things that, that often it's not even said, but there's like these, this implicit bias a lot of times against the males. And those, if you were to uncover that and let it breathe, these are the things that you might see coming out. And then we have the percentage of behavioral health workers who are Latino, who are male, 
Um, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next few slides. Next slide, please. All right, so what we're looking at is um, data from 2018 from APA. And this is, uh, we're looking at the diversity of the psychology workforce. Um, and so if we just take a look at this and we look at that top bar graph, we can see the relative space that is occupied by people who identify as Hispanic that, that make up the US psychology workforce. So that's 5%, 5%. And that's, that's a huge difference between um, just the general population. How many, uh, what is the percentage of Hispanics that are making up the general population, right? So we only, so we're underrepresented, underrepresented um, by and large in the field of psychology. And this is true when you look at the existing workforce, when you look at uh, psychologists in academia, early career psychologists, we, we actually make a bigger chunk um, but, but we still, it's not enough. And that's just looking at psychology. And in looking for this data, I was really um, hungry for it and searching for data for, that would look at all the behavioral health professions um, along demographic lines and, and also gender lines. And I just couldn't find something that was looking at it uh, um, that would give me a slice of what it looks like nationally. I did find a lot of data on specific states for example, Washington state and Ohio um, and some other states like that. And what I decided to do is just focus on my own state, which is New Mexico for a few different reasons. Next slide, please. One of those reasons is that New Mexico is a minority majority state. So we have um, a lot of people who identify as Hispanic and Latino in New Mexico. And if you put Hispanic and Latino and the other minorities, the next largest group being people who are indigenous, all together, they make up around 51%, 52% of the population of the state. So we have a huge percentage of people in our state that are uh, Latino. And so I would hope that, that uh, uh, some of that disparity might be um, less visible in New Mexico than it is in other places. So what we're going to look at is some data here that was compiled by um, our, our, the state of New Mexico's Children, Youth, and Families Department, the Behavioral Health Services. Um, we did this data in 2016. Go ahead and next, do show us the next slide. And so this shows um, the authors of the data and the report. And I'm fortunate um, to be one of the authors of both um, the survey and, and the report that we're looking at now. And here, there's a hyperlink um, that can that you can click, and it'll actually take you to a PDF of the full report. I'm, I just pulled out pieces of the report that had to do with things that are germane to our topic today. Next slide. And so, if we look at gender of behavioral health providers in New Mexico, and I, I will say that this is looking at psychologists, social workers, um, mental health counselors, and addictions counselors. All four of them. That's what we're looking at here. And the way, the way the survey went out, it was an electronic survey that went to everybody that held a license with the psychology board, the social work board, and the counseling board. And so, um, and then people, it was a completely voluntary study. So what we found in our completely voluntary study is that 76.8% of um, behavioral health providers in New Mexico identify as female, right? With only 21.5% identifying as male. And as, a, as an instructor of, um, of counseling programs, I've also taught a little bit in social work programs. I am often the only male in the room. I'm, in an, I'm the only male in a room of 20 students, right? And so, um, so that definitely fits with my experience and that males in the field are, are rare, you know, and it's, we're fortunate to have some, we have four males in the field uh, participating in, the, in this series. Next slide. All right, so here we're looking at um, how do people identify culturally? And so um, we have the largest group at 63.4% identifying as white. And the next largest group is Hispanic or Latino at 27%. And then from there, the next largest group would be American Indian or Alaska Native at 6.5%. Next slide. 
And then we asked everybody, in what languages are you able to provide services? And so um, the largest language that was represented other than English was Spanish, um, but it was only 20% of the workforce could speak Spanish. And then we had a lot of th th those languages that you're seeing there are different indigenous languages that are um, indigenous to the New Mexico region. And so, um, so we only had 20% identify as being able to provide services in Spanish. Next slide. So some reflections here um, are, and these are questions that I'm gonna invite you all to answer in the chat box. So the first question is how do we recruit more males into our workforce? So if you have any ideas at all, go ahead and type that into the chat box. How do we recruit more males into our workforce? So I'll give you a moment to just ponder that. And, and if anything comes to mind, just go ahead and put it in the chat. So the next question to reflect upon is, how do we recruit and retain bilingual providers? So ideally, we want males who are bilingual. Um, but these are asking about those two things separately. And how do we support those individuals once they're recruited? So while you're thinking of some, some ideas with that, I'm gonna tell you um, a little bit about what I've been involved in in New Mexico. And that is um, really trying to work with our state's Medicaid office to begin to offer a higher uh, reimbursement rate for services provided in a language other than English. And so the idea is, um, that if you provide a service, if you're bilingual and, um, and you're providing services in Spanish, for those services in Spanish, you will get paid more because the agency gets paid more. And hopefully that will be mostly a pass through to the direct clinicians so that the clinicians who are speaking Spanish, providing those services in Spanish, um, will, will receive higher compensation. And one of the reasons why that's so crucial is it's been my experience that um, male bilingual clinicians or even just bilingual clinicians in general, whether they identify as a male or not, um, often they are um, very much aware that they need to make a, a little bit more money just to make ends meet. We don't make a lot in this field, that's just a reality. And so um, they see a program director job or some other administrative level job and they, they are geared in that direction. And so what happens is um, those folks will provide two to three years of clinical service, and then they will level up, if you will, into administrative roles. And then we just miss out on all that really good bilingual services that they have been provided, especially now that they are an experienced clinician who's bilingual. We are losing our experienced bilingual clinicians to administrative non-clinical roles just because if they pay you know two to three more dollars per hour so if we were to create the infrastructure that actually incentivizes them to provide clinical services in a language other than english likely we will hold on to those people more because they will get paid to do what they they love to do without the added re responsibility and stress of an administrative position they're still very much clinical um, but they're actually getting compensated for the additional skill set that they that they have. So we do have some stuff in the chat box that I want to uh, that I want to attend to. And so Glory says scholarships. I completely agree, Glory, that we need to have scholarships specifically targeted towards males uh, entering the field. Um, because one of the reasons is when we have a male scholarship, then we are, we do outreach towards males in the field. And we also celebrate males in the field by saying, so-and-so just won this um, scholarship. And so they get some notoriety. So they become, males become more um, visible in our field. So uh, Rob Roberto is one of, uh, one of my colleagues um, who led the first session. He says, perhaps a place to start regarding recruitment of whales in the, males in the workforce relates to thinking through how our teaching preparation is attractive to males, responsive to their needs. Might we be teaching, even if implicitly, the various stereotypes we've been talking about here? 
So I think um, you bring up a, a really good point, Roberto, in that if you look at um, the workforce, who is primarily female, primarily identify as white. And one thing I left out um, that I know just from our own data in New Mexico is most of our workforce is above the age of 50. So we have white females above the age of 50 um, making up over 70% of our workforce and they become the teachers and they create the norms of our profession based on their own life experience, which there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing toxic about that. There's nothing, I don't have any negative thing to say about that other than it's not gonna match with the lived experience of a young Latino male. It just, it just isn't there. The positionality is sufficiently different to where, um, you know, when you enter the field as a young Latino male, you have to learn how to sink or swim really quickly um, in educational systems and classrooms, doing your, your peer work, your group work, doing presentations, you have to figure out, well, what makes everybody in this room feel safe, right? And if it, the safe is, is the norm and the norm is uh, older white women, then you will automatically begin to becoming, you know, uh, bicultural in that cultural group. And again, there's nothing wrong with that cultural group. And as a matter of fact, we have a shortage of all behavioral health providers. So we need all hands on deck, right? But there's this loss that happens. Uh, and I experienced getting into, into the field and I've experienced it in all the years that I've been teaching um, that I have to hold on to my push the positionality as a Latino male whose life experience does not match with that of my students, does not match with that of my colleagues. You know, it, it is unless I'm in a workshop like this then, then there's going to be a tremendous amount of overlap uh, of life experience. So I think that's a really good point. So Glory also says we need Spanish speaking educators in colleges and universities, Spanish materials. Again, Glory, I, I love your comments and thank you so much for sharing those. Uh, Juan says, um, I would imagine that Latino male voices would be present in our thinking of workforce, pipelines, curriculum developments, or social roles. So, right, we would need to make those voices present. Um, and in a way, we need to amplify those voices because they are so few and far between. Um, Angela says, I've noticed so speaking, seeking a higher level education in behavioral health are also predominantly feel, female, at least here in Hawaii. That's interesting um, that, that you see that also in Hawaii. Again, that fits with my experience in New Mexico. Um, and also in, in uh, Oregon, where I lived and worked for a few years too. And then uh, Christian says, Christian says, I feel much of this starts at a young age, continuing to normalize the ideas that males can take part in counseling will also open the idea of this being a profession they can go into. I can't agree with you more, Christian. And, and actually, one of the things that that reminds me of is um, it's related to the data and uh, the data. The other side of this is that, so we have 70% of the workforce in New Mexico is uh, white females over the age of 50. But when we look at who is accessing services, it's young Latino males. You know, I, I don't think it's 70%, but it's over 50% of the people accessing services are young Latino males. And why is that? It's because the single largest referral source for behavioral, behavioral health services in New Mexico and across the country is the criminal justice system and um, family protective service systems. So those two systems, also school disciplinary systems, right? If we look at all those systems, who are the ones that are getting in trouble the most? They're gonna be male. And unfortunately, overrepresented are gonna be Latino males. So we have a bunch of young Latino males being, being served by a bunch of older um, Anglo uh, females. And so there is this, this, um, this mismatch of culture that's, uh, that's occurring all the time, all the time, all the time, right? And so those of us that are in the field that are interested in this, you know, we should take um, 
some responsibility in helping those those um, those females in the field to um, to do um, just to to narrow their blind spots, to connect more meaningfully, and to to realize um, just some some things about who they're speaking to, who's sitting across from them when they provide services. And so um, we have a comment from Roberto, which I'm happy to, um, to go to him, but I do wanna just allude to something that Pierluigi said at the beginning of around technical difficulties. So I do wanna just let you all know that unfortunately, I'm not feeling well today. So there might be some times today where I have to excuse myself and then I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of Roberto and Juan and Pierluigi uh, while I uh, attend to my, to my own needs. Um, but I'm, I am very happy to be here. I'm very happy to talk about this topic that, that I feel so strongly about. Um, but right now I'm going to see what uh, Mr. Gursa has to say to us all. Hey, Brian, I mean, I was thinking about, uh, you know, I'm struck by um, the figures right here in Colorado the proportion of our behavioral health workforce, not just in mental health services provision, but in substance use and abuse services um, is non-reflective, right, of the um, proportion of Latinos in our overall population. Um, I'm struck by these numbers. Um, so the question about how do we raise them, I think is critical, right? Um, in looking at some of the responses and some of our conversation um, so far, you know, one strategy, right, uh, um, seeks to focus on the family, that within families we normalize for um, our hijos, for our Latino males, the idea that helping others, that um, ultimately going into a social service or a behavioral health career is something that is consistent and appropriate, right, for males, just as it might be for any son or daughter in a family. And, and I think that's seductive uh, to think like that's an important place to start. But I also think it doesn't really fully explain things. Because when I think of for example, the numbers of our young Latino males who go into the arts, arguably a field that kind of requires being outside of yourself, expressiveness, uh, awareness of the world around you, right? Uh, all features that are important, I think anyway, uh, for a counselor, uh, for a therapist. When you think about our young Latino males who go into ministry, um, whether into Catholic seminary or into whatever uh, faith-based ministry, um, those are positions that also require a real commitment to interpersonal relationships, right? So my point here is that if we can think of other career paths that require the same kind of elements having heard the same kind of messages where we see young Latino males going into, well, why is it that we are not seeing that in this field? So I think my point here is that the answer is considerably more complex than just something, issues that are rooted in the way that we socialize children within our familias. That, that, that was my point. I see, oh, Brian, I, I see you just came back. Uh, yeah. I realized for a second that you weren't there, so I was going to vamp for a, a little bit. No, thank you, Roberto. I think you bring up a lot of good points. Also, Oscar uh, Hernandez, he writes, I must admit that I'm stumped by the questions. Great questions. I wonder if a place to start is in the home, creating an environment for boys and men that is okay and normalized to be interested in helping others and serving others. For the parents to model those values, also not to diminish, diminish the importance of physical labor. I say this based on my own experience growing up with Latino males where the emphasis is more on physical labor. I'm still processing an answer on these questions, but I think by starting there, as time goes on, there may be greater interest in the helping field. Thoughts? I think that's very true, you know, and I think that a lot of us, you know, it's in a way, we're like talking to ourselves again, like the choir talking to the other choir, you know, and just looking at our own families. Um, there might have been an opportunity there for us to see 
males um, that really did care, that really did listen, um, you know, and yeah, they also worked hard and a lot of that was physical labor, but there was also a, it wasn't so crazy to think about you can make a living just by talking to people. But now that I say that, I hear the falseness of my own recollections, you know. I remember when I got my degree and I told my grandma what I did for a living. And uh, so I told her I'm a counselor and she's like, what do you mean? You talk to people. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, and you get paid? And I was like, yeah. And she just had this very like puzzled look on her face. And then finally I told her, you know, I help people with addictions. You know, people who use drugs or drink too much. She goes, oh, good, like your cousin Ronnie. Good, I'm glad somebody's helping them. And so she could accept that. I don't know what she thought that meant when I told her I help people with who use drugs or drink too much. But that was something she can wrap her head around. But it wasn't really, she couldn't really figure out exactly what I did, um, even, you know, until till she passed. And so it was just very abnormal <laughs> what I did. As abnormal as that is, I have a cousin who's also a social worker. So somehow we figured this out, you know, probably through our own healing as a matter of fact. So, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So what can we do, you know? So young Latinos need to see more representation of Latino males in all the helping professions, but especially in behavioral health, behavioral health, right? Um, also, older Latinos can mentor younger Latinos through formal and informal means. And by the way, you're never too old to find a mentor. So I've had a lot of mentors in my career, but I'm sorry to say the very, only one of them has been Latino. You know, one out of the top five in my life have been Latino, you know? And so, and that has to do with um, just not having access or availability. But those of us, again, who are in this, these roles and those of you who are attending, there is somebody that probably is looking up to you. And, uh, and you know, we have to create some time and space to, to just have informal conversations, take them to lunch, not just give them jobs, but, but actually mentor them. Because they're looking uh, for clues from us as how do we survive in this field? How do we, how do we support a family in this field? How do we um, maintain our own identity in this field? So they're looking to us for those, those kinds of things. Um, we also need to recognize that Latino fathers are eager to provide, to teach, and even play with their kids. We need to sit, shift our approach to pull them in rather than push them away. So I think that, um, I think that often, again, if we look at who's providing services, um, a lot of them are women who are just more comfortable talking to the moms because the women that are in our field are often moms. And so they feel very comfortable speaking mom to mom about raising kids, about um, you know parenting, about supporting kids with behavioral health problems. Um, but until we have more fathers in the field, um, there's just not a whole lot of comfort level, I feel like. You know, and I don't wanna paint everybody with the same brush, of course not. You know, there's, there's women out there that, that white women that are older than 55 who are doing amazing work, who have more clinical expertise than I do and who can connect to people better than I can. I know that's, that's just reality. But again, I'm just talking about when we look at things at the macro level, that's where we can see the discrepancies, not in trying to find um, exceptions to the rule. And I don't want to trigger anybody to look for exceptions and say, well, I know this woman who's excellent. She's better than me. Of course you do. And of course I do, right? There's a, you know, the, your culture doesn't make you better. But, or worse, <laughs> or and your gender doesn't make you better or worse. But if we can't ignore the reality of this cultural mismatch, and that's what I want to bring our attentions to. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Um, we want to make Latino males and behavioral health visible. So I was introduced to this term unicorn. Um, you know, I was, I was working a long time ago in this position, and I was about to leave the position. 
And uh, my supervisor asked me, she was a, a white female, older, lots of experience, excellent clinician. She taught me a lot, but I was leaving and she said, so do you have any ideas on who should replace you? And I said, yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, you should find a, a, this person who should replace me. And just looking at, at who else is on the team here, you don't have any other males. So the person has to be male, should be Latino, should be bilingual and should be able to, to deal with both addiction and mental health, addiction and mental health. So, um, and then she looked at me, she said, well, Brian, I want a unicorn too, but I can't find one. And so that's where I was introduced to this term unicorn, where she described this, this perfect candidate of young, like youngish male Latino who's bilingual, who is co-occurring capable as um, if you see one in the wild, you know, it's like singing a unicorn because they're so rare. And uh, I had a guy working with me um, who was in school to be a social worker, Juan Martinez. And he and I had a running joke. And uh, I was trying to get him to come back to my agency because he just graduated with his master's in social work. He's young, he's Latino, he's, um, he's bilingual. And, uh, but he said, no, you know, I've, uh, I did an internship um, with people who are using sign language, ASL, and I'm almost fluent in ASL. And so I want to go from being a unicorn to being a Pegasus. <laughs> and I said, a oh, Pegasus? He's like, yeah, you know, a unicorn with wings. That's how rare I want to be. I want to be a trilingual Latino male. And so, um, so you know, we are too rare. We're just too rare. And so, um, also, we want to use and develop certified peer support workers. I feel like everybody, um, everybody in, in all the states, we have peer support workers now. And um, different agencies and different communities do um, a better job or a not so good job in supporting peer support workers. These are people with lived experience who are really good in helping clients adjust, navigate systems, um, all of that you know, and these are people with lived addiction or, or mental health experience. And I, I do feel like some agencies look at those people as assets. Some of them look at things like they just tolerate. Um, and sometimes, sometimes people look at them with fear, especially, you know, a lot of these folks that I've um, dealt with, that I've, that I've trained, that I've tried to mentor myself, they come from very rough ba backgrounds and they still look and sound really rough. Um, and so much as they're gang involved, drug involved, crime involved, um, you know, and, and that's not too far in their distant past, right? And so that's the asset is that they are all of those things and it's not too far in their distant past. And that gives them a, a, a very powerful connection to the clients. But because of all those things, sometimes they're seeing as people that need to be managed more than, than actual the, the future of our profession. And I feel that those peer support workers are an opportunity for us to identify people that, that we need in this profession, that we need to continue to nurture and develop and help them get more and more credentials, more and more leadership positions. They are the future, um, you know, and, and we need to support them. We also need to invest in Latino males literally with money, right? So, and this goes back to what Glory was saying, we need to provide targeted scholarships and loan, re loan repayment uh, to male Latinos uh, entering the workforce. Um, and, and again, those, those, those can be male specific as a way to do targeted outreach, to make Latino males more visible, um, all of those things. So let's go ahead and, and uh, Go to the next slide. So these are some lessons from the field. And so one of the things that I learned, um, which I hadn't really appreciated or considered until I was working in, um, in this project, it was called the South Valley Male Involvement Project. And so this was in Albuquerque and it was in the South Valley. And those of you who are not familiar with that, um, the South Valley of Albuquerque, it, it is um, very much uh, culturally, um, the Mexican part of Albuquerque. So shops, grocery stores, restaurants, uh, clothing stores, schools, you name it. It's very Mexicano, 
like the whole valley. And so we were working in there and the male involvement piece of it was uh, we were trying to help males become more involved in uh, taking responsibility to not be involved in drugs or alcohol, not be involved in gangs, not be involved in teenage paternity, and if they are, to be involved in the lives of their children. So we had we had a pretty broad range of things we can we could do with the community, and so and we did. We that was probably some of the most creative, satisfying uh, times in my professional career was um, working for that project um, because we did everything from using young Latinos to, to do bilingual public service announcements. They wrote a play that was performed all over the city that had to do with all of those topics, pregnancy, drugs, violence, gangs, you name it. Um, quinceaneras, everything was, they, they threw everything into the play that they wrote. And it was, it was a masterpiece by the time it was done. Um, but that's, that's what I'm drawing from a lot of my lessons, you know, also clinically. So that was more of a public healthy kind of job. I've also been involved clinically for over 20 years in the working with Latino males. And so one of the things I saw in that was this phenomenon that would happen where a young couple would um, experience a pregnancy, right? And so for the female part of that couple, there would be a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, uh, this big explosion in the family, but it wouldn't last that long, right? Um, and uh, the family would, would and that explosion of like, how could you do this? What were you thinking? That's so irresponsible. And then all of a sudden it would, boom, like the explosion would just come back in and, and, and turn into this protective bubble around the, the young female where, you know, the childcare was being done by the grandparents or the aunts or the sisters or other people in the family. Um, they would just really rally around her and she would wind up staying in school because she had such a robust family response of support. But what would happen is that family support would just kind of push, you know, the young father out. And the young father was often seen as, how could you do this to Mahita? She had so much potential. She got good grades and look at what you did to her. Look at what you did to her, right? And so they would protect her, you know, and a lot of the support that the young lady would experience would be conditional on, we'll do all this, but you can't see him anymore. He's no good for you. And so here he was on the outs, getting judgment from his family for being irresponsible and, and not being involved in his kid's life. But every attempt he tried to, you know, keep in mind these were teenagers. So they didn't have a lot of ego tricks. So they couldn't tolerate a lot of, you know, mean comments, mean looks by, by you know, the, the adults in the young lady's family, right? They just, they didn't have the ego strength to withstand a lot of that. And so really, I mean, they really didn't have a whole lot of options other than to bow out, you know? And so the male involvement project, we were really trying to support them. And we had young father groups uh, supporting them and, uh, and weathering the storm of trying to reconnect to their, to their children. And one of the things um, that was very um, rewarding for me, and I'm gonna skip down a little bit on the slide, talk about the privilege walk exercise. So a lot of people have done a privileged walk exercise. A lot of times it's um, just to be a little real and maybe even a little crude is that, you know, you do this in graduate school and it separates the brown from the non-brown in, in a very quick way, right? That doesn't always feel good. Our, the way we use this privilege walk exercise, you know, this is the exercise where you say, you know, if you grew up in a home or you were read to take one step forward, if you, if you um, spent uh, any year of your life without health insurance, take one step back. So that's the exercise I'm talking about. You'll find it all over YouTube if you didn't experience it yourself in, in some school. Um, what we did in our privilege walk exercise, so keep in mind, this is all young fathers. And we did it in, on Father's Day at a park where they, they, they brought their kids. And what we did was uh, we did the first part, which was unearned privilege. And no surprise, a lot of them didn't have a lot of unearned privilege. Those are the unearned privileges that come across from, you know, things that came before you that you have no control over, 
This is where you uncover economic privilege, white privilege, that sort of thing. A lot of these young fathers did not move much with the unearned privilege piece of the, the exercise. But then we add to it and we do um, the earned privileges. And we, we had the, the young fathers, we would say, take a step forward if you brought your son with you to the park today. And of course, all of them did, right? So they step forward. And while they're walking, they have their kids on top of their feet. And so um, the, the actual metaphor and the, the felt sense is that these young fathers are carrying their kids forward so that they start this, this, this journey of life in a different place. The kids get to start in a different place than the dads did. So we say, take a step forward for every skill that you have that someone has paid you to use. And so a lot of these young fathers had eight jobs, you know, by the time they were 17. And some of them also cut hair on the side. Some of them also do tattoos on the side. Some of them fix cars on the side. Some of them do landscaping on the side. So a lot of them were taking like six to eight steps forward, um, you know, and all of a sudden they were carrying their kids forward. And we said, take a step forward for every language you speak. And all of them took two steps forward for speaking both English and Spanish. And so at the end of it, you know, there was just so much, you could just feel the hope that they were, they were, everything that they were doing and everything that they were working hard to earn um, was setting up their children um, to, to just be a little bit further down the road than where they started. And that's very powerful. So the, maybe the last thing that I'll talk about, um, well, we do have time for me to address the, the other two bullet points, father hunger. So in working with adolescent males, and you know, most of the adolescent males I work with, they get in trouble, right? Um, and so that's, that's why they wind up in my office. They get in trouble for having drugs at school. They get in trouble for DWIs. They get in trouble for fighting. They get in trouble for a lot of reasons, uh, stealing, whatever, right? They're in trouble, either teen court, the school, POs, JPOs, somebody's sending them to talk to me. And, um, and when I was younger, I didn't experience father hunger. Uh, it was more like big brother hunger. Like they saw me as the, the older brother they wish they had, you know, or, or the uncle maybe that they wish they had. You know, somebody that, that came from neighborhoods like they came, up, came from, um, but they didn't make it. You know, they, they had a lot of examples of people who don't make it. And so here I was as a guy who's, who's made it. Uh, when by that I mean I've, I've actually survived um, and, uh, and I also wind up with an education at the end of it. And so, so uh, they would really attach really quickly. Of course, there'd be this testing. They'd wanna know who I am, where I'm from and what experiences I have. And once, once they realize that they see themselves in me, then boom, that connection is so intense. Um, and, and as I get older, it's even more intense. You know, because I, I do, I'm at the age now where I am kind of like a father figure to a lot of these young men. And I take that, you know, almost as a sacred responsibility. I don't feed into it, you know, in some sort of warped pathologi pathological way, of course. I just feel it and I recognize it and I know where it's coming from because I was that kid. I was that kid, you know, I grew up without a father figure. And so I, would, I needed that, you know, and so... So I, I feel that from the young Latino males that I work with. And that just, that just shows you that we can't have um, this mismatch happening. You know, um, we can't be okay with it. Of course, we, we validate all the work that everybody in our field is doing, but we can't be okay with, you know, if there really is this need to see Latino males who have emotional intelligence, who have, you know, compassion, and an education and they're still real. We have a need for those people in our field and it's just not gonna be met by um, people that they can identify with. The, uh, their other needs can be met and they can learn a lot from those other providers, but we need people like us serving um, people like who we used to be. Um, so I think that that's a, go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, Ruth, please. And so, so that's where I want to transition now 
to some of the other folks uh, in the in the room with us. Um, and um, I, I do have to say I'm not feeling well right now. So uh, I think I'm going to bow out for a minute and, and let these very accomplished gentlemen uh, take the ball for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, you know, I, I did write in the chat that I think it's such a true testament of what we're talking about, that that honor among Latino males, Latino fathers, and, and your commitment to this series is, you know, has got me extremely touched. So I really, truly appreciate, and I hope you feel better soon. And, and we do have a, an amazing panel here with Roberto and Juan, and, and we'll continue this conversation and just reminding everyone, if you have, um, questions, please use the Q&A so we don't lose it, lose it in the chat. Uh, the, the chat conversation has been fantastic. It has been amazing. And I think the, the whole presentation uh, it has been superb. I, I echo all the comments. Focusing on this slide, and maybe um, Juan, Roberto, and I can, can uh, follow your, your lead here. And you know, what are some challenges or successes you've been encountering against your Latino males in your career? And you know, first I want to kind of acknowledge um, the continuum, the breadth, the the width of of what Latino male really uh, encompasses. We've been discussing so many formats, but we have to take into account that we have Latino males who are U.S. born, who are foreign born from 22 different countries who uh, come to the United States at different time in their lives under different situations. Um, some have Spanish as primary language, some have English as primary language, some are bilingual or trilingual and, and some are monolingual with different levels of acculturation and, and assimilation. So, you know, and the way I read your question, I actually read it uh, from two points, you know, what Latino males I was exposed to that kind of helped me and um, what challenges, successes I encountered in engaging Latino males um, in my career. So, you know, the, the first Latino male figure in my life, of course, my father, and, and there were many um, behaviors that he exhibited that were healthy behaviors. Uh, there were some unhealthy that he later changed in, in life, thank God, but as many of us, um, we make changes as we go along. But some of the healthy behaviors I find myself um, performing today. You know, one of them was he would read every newspaper, news magazine, and I inherited that. So I'm, I'm a news junkie. I, I read anything I can get my hands on that has to do with local, state, national, and international events. Um, so there were a lot of modeling that was happening. I didn't know it was called modeling, but I ended up assuming some of that. And then reversing the coin, challenges that in, in my career, we had a, a very, very successful um, adolescent uh, program for behavioral health in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And we saw uh, initially kids 13 to, to 19, and then some younger kids in, in prevention, and then some other um, younger than 13 in, in intervention as well. And challenges that we saw is that, that they had, the, the challenges that I witnessed, is many times they, um, they were in a single household, but not necessarily because of divorce. Uh, it, was it was because one of the parents was working somewhere else. They, they were just not able to be in the same household. They would talk by phone and, and communicate, but they, so there was not that presence. The father was not physically present and it was only uh, a, a conversations and, and um, other forms of communication. And by default, um, you know, the youth, the Latino males that, that were growing up did not have that modeling. They didn't have that, uh, that adult father who was uh, showing them or, or talking to them or, 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 or teaching them. And, and I think that that was a big void in many of these uh, kids' lives because what that meant is that they really didn't have 
the the knowledge, the information of how to grow up, how to how to be an honorable Latino male, like we've been discussing for for three sessions. Uh, things like they wouldn't have anyone to talk to about, you know, what do you do if you're the first one to to graduate high school or or to think about college or or um, and then having uh, even if they had parents at home, uh, that was an issue in, in education where, where the son or the daughter was now um, receiving higher educational levels that either parent achieved uh, in their adulthood. So, so I, I would leave that there with some of the um, comments or answers for, for this question. Uh, Juan, would you mind going next? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I did kind of think through this and kind of just, you know, building off of some of your experiences, you know, that I, I can relate to as well. And all coming from those experiences with, with, with fatherhood, right? Um, so my father was very emotive, very expressive. He was the youngest male in his family out of 11. Um, so, you know, that was something that he always wanted to do differently from his father, which was very rigid and very, um, you know, emotionless. And, you know, that's, that's uh, an experience that I, you know, taught me through that it's okay to, um, to share your feelings, that it's okay to, you know, have friendships and it's okay to do these things that are, you know, are different than how I grew up, you know, and I think his model was, you know, we can do it better. We can do it better. Um, and at the end of the day, with these experiences, you know, I always had a sense of, I owe it to the man, right? I owe it to my family because of all the sacrifices of coming into this country, sleeping in a cardboard um, makeshift mattress to work at a restaurant where he first landed at 16 years old, um, where, you know, that I am kind of the, the embodiment of all those sacrifices that I was able to finish high school, you know, all the way to getting a master's degree. And even that, you know, it is huge. So there are struggles within those narratives that, that, that bring a lot of deep empathy for me and a lot of understanding in terms of where we're heading with uh, the conversations with Latino like, males when they have come into the office and, and talked about, um, you know, what was happening, whether um, it be at an outpatient setting, whether it be the crisis setting, um, the hospital, all the way to, you know, just doing community work out there with promotoras or doing workshops or domestic violence classes um, and so on. So, you know, it kind of depends on, 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 on those settings in terms of that, that engagement. And um, some of the successes is that kind of, I do have that deep empathy that I can relate to, you know, in terms of having that respect for what you do, that pride, um, and, you know, being here in, the, in this, um, to, to progress and make it better for the next generation. Um, so in that, I can relate to it at a deep level. Um, and some of the challenges are, you know, when you do work under these institutions where the normalized uh, behaviors are the nine to five, the, you know, we do well with white women, you know, um, where we more emphasis on the children as yes, a separate entity from, from the family uh, where you're kind of just forced to grapple with, you know, what your gut is telling you in terms of, you know, I should do this differently than this normalized institutionalized behavior um, versus, you know, doing what your gut is telling you to do than being almost shamed in a way and or, you know, you're creating more work for everybody or this is kind of too, too different for our norm to function as an institution. Um, and with, with all that being said, and it's something that I really wanna challenge everybody to thinking is that the presence of Latino male in the behavioral health um, space, how are you defining the problem? And when I talked about my presentation uh, in looking underneath the iceberg, I, I really want to ask everybody, is it really that, you know, you have nobody to work for you? Or is it really that you don't have somebody to lead with you? You know, is it really that you're looking to fill a void? Or is it really that are we looking to evolve a field? 
right? So I really want to pay attention to those assumptions because that can lead to interventions that make the assumption that Latino males aren't here because they're, they're individual, um, there's an individual flaw to them, right? It's a character component and that's a very individualistic mindset to, to assume those things as opposed to the we, right? Well, let's look at those environments that we were brought up in, right? Let's look at the institutions that are developing us. Let's look at the friendships and neighborhoods that, that are allowing us to generate our own internal narratives of who we should be and where we should go. Um, so a long story short, um, there's a lot of pieces of that that would um, uh, continue the conversation for this uh, for this question. I just want to pass it on to Roberto before going on and on and on. <laughs> thank you, Juan. Appreciate that. Roberto. Uh, thank you, Juan and Pierre Luigi. I, I just wanted to point out for those of you that may have seen that uh, Brian logged off of the call. Um, I, I, I just want to thank him for coming here, he, he was really not feeling at all well today and that he was able to keep it together for, you know, over an hour, I, th I think was tremendous, but just, just be aware that um, he had to log off and uh, care for himself. Um, and, and, and we, of course, however, will go on. When Brian shared this question, asked us to think about it, uh, I thought a lot about the early part of my career when I was doing uh, primarily solely direct service as a family therapist. Um, and, and as I thought through it, I realized that my caseloads uh, were always represented uh, with Latino fathers uh, in the context of doing family therapy. Personally, professionally, I never found myself needing to kind of answer the question of, hey, how do I go and get Latino fathers to participate? I think in part, um, it, it clearly, I think, has to do with that, you know, line from that, that movie, Build It and They Will Come, provide a care provider that um, you at least feel on the surface has some possibility of sharing your life experience of understanding where you're coming from and you're going to be more likely not only to engage but to continue to be engaged in a uh, course of treatment so i think you know mostly it was that um, and then i got to thinking about the middle part of my career which was primarily uh, as a supervisor and consultant of almost exclusively other Latinos and Latinas, people of color, who were providing family therapy. The majority of that group were female. I mean, in my experience, eight out of 10. Um, and it, it, perhaps the most frequent supervisory question was around, man, you know, Roberto, I'm having so much trouble um, uh, around getting this father to be engaged in the care uh, of his family. A and I can't tell you how many times the simple question for me, which was, well, did you call and invite him? Did you have a conversation to let him know how important his voice as the father in this family is in this course of treatment? It was, it was stunning. Uh, how many times the answer was, oh, well, no, I guess I never did, right? Um, so so I, I, I think that's a in really super important issue to look at. And, and, and I don't mean to suggest that only Latino males uh, are capable of engaging Latino males in treatment, but I do think that it's really critical for us to think through I talked about in my presentation, our internal landscape, what kinds of attitudes, especially those ones that we haven't really fully surfaced and appreciated, but that nonetheless we exude uh, when we are communicating with other people that implicitly is giving the message of, oh, I'm kind of scared of you. Uh, oh, you, you really are an absent father. It's not really kind of worth my therapeutic time to figure out how to engage you. And I'm gonna work with what's in front of me. Um, 
the 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 last component uh, of my career, the last third of it, has been more administrative uh, in thinking through the kind of models of care, how we teach organizationally, what do we need to pull together? And I think one of the answers that, uh, one of the solutions that I think carries some of the answer has to do with how we define what therapy or counseling or course of mental health intervention is. Juan, you'll remember, um, Juan and I were fortunate uh, to work with a man who, as a young person, played soccer, played through his young adult career. He was a soccer player uh, and was a dad and now was a soccer coach. And he approached us and said, hey, you know, I've got this idea, right? Latino fathers, right, are soccer coaches, right? They are on the field on Saturday and Sunday, you know, empeñados, right, uh, to care not only for their kids who might be playing, but for all of the children who are engaged in the sport. He really came at soccer from this place of youth development, not about winning championships and winning games, but about using sports as a vehicle for growing competence, self-assurance, all of those kinds of things. And he recognized that a significant component of that was the consejos that coaches can give to members of their team. Now, in English, when we say counseling, right, yeah, I think it is much more likely for us to think about counseling as a profession. In Espanol, when we say consejería or consejos, it's very different, right? It's about imparting wisdom. It's about giving advice. It's about practically being involved in helping somebody with real solutions, right, for what it is that they might be facing. And he pitched us on, hey, would mental health see a way to be involved in this league um, and help provide those uh, soccer coaches, uh, the, both the dads and the moms, with a consejería mental health perspective that they can take with them as they not only teach children how to play soccer, but teach them how to be effective people in the world. I'll tell you, it, it was it, it was terrific, right? Um, and, and we did um, a number of kind of large, at the beginning of the soccer season, um, we, we had all the parents uh, come uh, to a large hall, right? Uh, and part of it was just kind of negotiating the beginning of the season schedules and all that kind of thing. But uh, a number of mental health people, including Juan, um, got up to talk uh, to the families about this component. And I'll tell you, when I looked through across the room, in, in rooms like that, in those psychoeducational venues that we often give as mental health providers, you know, not surprisingly, it's almost exclusively mothers and their children. In those rooms, when I looked around, it, I'm telling you, it was 50-50. It was mothers and fathers uh, and their children. Um, and, and, and it just occurs to me that as we work through this, it might be helpful for us to rethink, to expand uh, where the leverage points are, how we define what therapy or consejería is, and think outside of the box and come up with strategies for meeting and engaging not only Latino families, but Latino fathers in a way that is relevant and responsive uh, to the truth of, the, uh, of their lives. Do you remember that one? Thank you so much, Roberto. Oh. Oh yeah, you, you brought lots of smiles in my face. I'm going yeah, back. Yeah, I, I can like, see. Oh my god, that is so awesome. That is a memory that I haven't tapped into in a while. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> so one of the things that we can um, continue to talk about, you know, I made a couple of notes because there was so much information on on that presentation, and you know, one of them was that that same note about counseling in our communities, but also. How how have we personally uh, demonstrated? Because you know we're in this field, right? So how have we demonstrated to not only our own family, our own sons and daughters, but to young people around us that you know counseling should be the most normalized thing, uh, just like going to any 
dentist, doctor, um, dermatologist, you know, any other health professional. You know, and, and in my own personal experience, I came to the United States when I was 13 years old. Uh, my family, as I mentioned before, is my father was Italian, my mother is Colombian. We have family in both countries, both cultures were extremely well celebrated. You know, but my own children, uh, my son who's 23 now, my daughter is 24, uh, they were not exposed. They did not have the opportunity to go to Colombia um, because there was internal fighting within the family. And so sending them to Colombia, like many families do to learn the language and see the culture when they were little was not an option in our family because of that. And nobody ever talked about, hey, maybe we can work this out with some family therapy. You know, that never came up. It was actually the opposite of where um, family wanted to remain dysfunctional uh, because nobody had ever introduced that. And the way counseling was viewed with me growing up, it, it wasn't. It wasn't even part of the conversation. I don't remember any single instant in, in my house where people talked about going to a therapy until my father went into treatment for, for his uh, alcohol use disorder. And um, thank God for the last 20 years of his life, he was in recovery. And But that was the first time that we started in, being introduced to it. So what I've done in, in my own family with my own children, you know, I've normalized it. You know, when I've been to therapy and I'm going out the door and say, hey, daddy, where are you going? I'm going to counseling. You know, it's just, it's, it's a normalization of the conversation in our own household. So what happens today when both my kids, any of my kids, if they have any kind of emotional distress, they say, hey, dad, can you help me find somebody? Uh, I need to talk to somebody. It became a normal thing, just like, you know, if I have a headache or if I break a bone, hey, dad, can you take me, you know, get my, my arm fixed? And that's how I, I I've been able to do this. And working in the field, yes, has helped that. Um, because they, they've seen my office and they've been to my office and they knew all these other counselors and, and the whole spectrum of, of professionals in behavioral health. Uh, so, and, and I, I'm conscious not everyone has that opportunity, but I think we do have that in our own household. Uh, Juan, would you like to comment on that next? Yeah, definitely. And completely agree. And I can relate to, to that family component. Um, so in my family, I'm the first of a lot of things and being a mental health professional was completely out of the question. It wasn't even part of everybody's narrative of who I was going to grow up to be. There was a lot of other talk about being architecture and lawyer and all these other high profile things that seem intriguing because, you know, they make good money, but really wasn't satisfying to the heart. So, um, that normalization came through, well, you know, I, I, I'm reflective, I like philosophy, I like have deep conversations, I love to connect with people. Um, and, and I, and I want to help my community, I want to give back, you know, what, uh, what, what I can offer in terms of, you know, um, thriving and making my family sacrifices to get me here worth the while. So there's this constant motivation um, and drive to to make sure I'm able to share that with everyone. Um, and and that, that came with a lot of education, um, came with a lot of, you know, uh, rebranding what mental health meant. And at the end of the day, it's just being healthy, just being able to have some places to vent where it makes sense for you. And even having a, a, a guidance or a North Star or even not being alone in, in those sufferings and this turbulence. And at the core of it is that narrative that you share with everybody else when they're like, oh, I get it now. So it is like a doctor, you know, of the, of the feelings. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a feeling doctor. You can, you can totally roll with that. Um, and I think that, that that communication and that narrative, you know, that, that yeah, I'm an example of, and you, like Brian said, I'm, I can make it, I'm making it, right? Um, and, you know, I'm here to, to talk and, you know, I'm more than happy to fill your, your ear with whatever I can offer. <laughs> Thank you, Juan, I really appreciate it. Roberto, um, how have you been able to normalize this in, in your home, in your community? 
Well, you, you know, in, in my own lived experience, um, my, my, I'm one of eight children. Um, my parents, um, immigrantes uh, from Mexico um, in the 1950s. Um, I, I think I mentioned last time that I was the first born in California uh, of their children. Um, my mom was um, an artist, a painter, um, and a concert pianist, and my father was a physician and a uh, researcher, um, also um, was the principal founder of a uh, medical school in Mexico. And when he came here to this country, um, he came seeking to care for Mexicanos who he knew were up here in El Norte without any kind of medical care. And, and he came with a whole profession behind him with you know, all kinds of professional success. But as soon as he got here, he became the spick doctor. Um, he became, he was, he was a brilliant physician uh, and a brilliant educator. Um, and he could diagnose even the most complex things almost by smell, right? Um, and so, you know, he would tell stories, right, of his career when he came up here. And one story just continues to stick with me. When he was practicing up in Washington, he was seen as the spick doctor. Nobody, you know, wanted to be seen publicly consulting with him. But what would happen is that they would grab him and they'd pull him into the broom closet and say, Tico, right, uh, my dad's nickname, here, here's a case, right? And I need your advice, right? And they would listen and they would take that advice uh, and appropriately uh, apply um, that learning, that approach to their patients. But as soon as they left the broom closet, he was again the spick doctor, right? Um, so kind of that was part of um, kind of my education despite that, right? I think because of their own successes, regardless of contending with that kind of racism, all of their children were all doctors, uh, teachers, professors, journalists, right? So, you know, unlike uh, in many Latino families where there's that one child who's able to superar all of that and make it to college, all of us um, have advanced degrees. Um, so, so I recognize, right, that my own lived experience is one of privilege. Um, but despite that, right, um, you know, kind of learning those ropes and learning how to be successful at, in my life and that in my siblings' lives has always co-occurred with all those other factors that work against us uh, because of the color of our skin, because of the pronunciation of, uh, of our names. Thank you so much. You know, we, we're running out of time. I, I don't know if anyone has a last minute question they can put in the chat or the QA. But once again, before, before we end, um, you know, this topic during the month of June when we celebrated Father's Day and, and uh, we, you know, we all shared off camera our, our Father's Day events and, and so proud and, and, and lucky we are to, to be able to have that kind of interaction today. Um, but I want to personally thank you uh, both for your time, your effort, your dedication to this series. I think it's uh, beyond my expectations. I think the conversation has been rich. I hope it has enriched our audience. I appreciate the audience's participation in the chat. It's love, love to see you engaged and, and make those comments and identify with what we're talking about. And, but you know, with anything that the middle word of this is learning. So these are virtual learning sessions. And once we learn, uh, one of the things that, that I like to promote is that then we have an obligation. So if you learn something new here, um, if you learn how to dispel myths, or if you learn how to promote uh, healthy behaviors for Latino fathers, I think it's our obligation to pass that on uh, to other individuals. So I challenge everyone in the series um, to take that to heart. And if you have the opportunity to teach, then you can go ahead um, uh, and teach. And I think the uh, audience agrees with me. I'm already starting to see comments about that. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. And before I use those by saying thank you, I wanna see if you each have maybe a 30 to 45 second, uh, <laughs> AKA one minute <laughs> each uh, to uh, close the series and, 
and say uh, anything else you need to say to our participants before we go on to, to close them. And uh, Ruth, you can put the next slide so people can start having Brian's contact. And uh, Roberto, would you like to go first, please? Yeah, no, I, I, I think everything that you said, uh, Pierre Luigi, ditto. Um, I mean, I, I think um, in some ways, right, we, we've had a conversation. In some ways, we've started a conversation. I guess my challenge, not only to me, to my colleague panelists, but to all of my colleagues out there in the audience, the question becomes, how do you continue this conversation when you re-engage back in your community, outside of this context, back in your workplaces? So it isn't just about having that conversation here in this kind of context, it's about seeing how we apply it uh, once we go back to where we're from. Thank you so much, Juan. And thank you everybody for being present and allowing us to have this conversation. Um, you know, I agree with everybody and wanted to also include that, you know, one of the biggest things that I really wanna hit home with is to look at the assumptions that you're making about Latino men um, and uh, to look past the interventions that have been normalized for white women that you know, it takes a different set of skill sets and a different way of thinking to create programs, to create engagement, to listen to community. Um, and so all these things are underneath the, the water in the iceberg is something that I really think we should take time to reflect and understand more deeply so that we can understand the problem uh, more deeply, the root causes more deeply, and can find alignment in the interventions that are going to help communities out in general. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I, I'll thank Brian in absentia. He uh, had to log off, but here's his contact information. I'm sure he'll be happy to follow up if you have a question that, that you didn't get to ask or you didn't have to have it. Um, and also, I, I, I ask you, please keep Brian in your prayers uh, as he uh, continues to get better. Uh, so thank you for your participation and for the contributions you make to the health and well-being of our community. Uh, we hope to see you in future events. In the meantime, here is our contact information for the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. Please reach out to us for more information about our projects and to request training and technical assistance. Next slide, please. So there is, um, before I tell you um, about this, this is a QR code. So if you pull out your camera and just aim it to the QR code, you will automatically be taken to a, um, to a brief survey. And this uh, kindly ask you to take a couple of moments to fill out this important survey. You will receive a certificate of attendance shortly after you've completed the survey. And as we mentioned in the beginning, if you'll be interested in continuing education credits, uh, please contact uh, Ruth or Maxine or I, and we'll be happy to uh, send you the information for you to apply and uh, purchase those. Next slide, please. And we're honored to invite you to our 2021 Virtual National Latino Behavioral Health Conference, Envisioning Latino Behavioral Health Equity in the Next Decade. The virtual conference will be held on September 16 and 17. Please visit our website at nlbhconference2021.com to submit an award nomination to apply for a scholarship um, or to register for this important event. You can also purchase exhibit and sponsor opportunities on that same website. Um, call for proposals is closed and we hope to have a preliminary program in the next few weeks. So please keep, keep an eye on your email with that announcement. Next slide, please. And so thank you again for joining our event. Uh, that is all we have for you all today. And I want to say thank you to uh, Maxine Henry, our co-director, and Ruth Yanez, our uh, executive administrative assistant who drove the technology of the PowerPoint. Thank you all so much. Have a blessed rest of your day. Hasta luego, Roberto y Juan. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah.